give the Broncos a crack at catching up in the AFC West. Kansas City's 4-0 in the division, so maybe the Broncos' best shot is at a wild card. They have won the toss. Gary Anderson to kick off for the Steelers. It drives Derek Russell deep into the end zone, and he'll stay right there. So Elway leads them out, having the best year of his career statistically. Here's the offensive line. Keith Carts, who's missed much time with a broken hand, can play today. And Don Maggs, out for a long while with a bad back, also could see action. Backs and receivers, and they will often go with two wides and the two tight ends. If they go with their sub formation, then you'll see Milburn, you'll see Arthur Marshall in. From the 20-yard line, the pitch to Del Pino. Del Pino with good yardage, about eight to the 28, before being stopped by the free safety Darren Perry. Defensively, the front seven for the Steelers. One of the stingiest groups in the league, and they'll get the great outside rush from Kevin Green and Greg Lloyd from those outside backer spots. Woodson having the year of his career, and that's saying a lot because he's gone to the Pro Bowl four times. And if they go to the dime, we'll see figures, the rookie out of Colorado and Gary Jones. Second down, call it two. Del Pino again, but just about nothing. Into the arms of Gerald Williams and then plenty of help. I think you'll see, Bob, both these teams have talked a lot about wanting to run, and you see Denver trying to set the tone here early. First time they, catched, uh, they caught, they caught uh, Pittsburgh with the two deep. And the second time you saw Pittsburgh come up with the safety there and stop, stuffed them on uh, second down. Ordinarily, you'd think of it as a running down, third and two, but Cowher's defense, Wade Phillips on the other side, Cowher's defense has been the best in the league against the run. Don Caper is their defensive coordinator. Russell in motion. They'll put it in the air on third and two, short drop, and there's the completion to Shannon Sharp for the first down. A pickup of nine to the 37. You see Elway there starting off with one of his uh, absolute best years we've talked about. Here's the route, just a really an option route. Here the receiver has the option to break in or out or set down. He sets down because he caught him in zone there, Bob. Shannon Sharp. He's called off his bet with brother Sterling as to who would catch the most passes. It was a sucker bet. Sterling might be the best receiver in the league. Quick slant to Vance Johnson. Stopped by Rod Woodson. They're running more and more of that sort of play. The short drop, quick read, completion to Johnson. This is a, you get to take a look here, just a slant route on the outside. The way uh, Pittsburgh will try and counter that is to come up and play press man at times with their corners. And they're really geared to kind of stop that kind of pass. But you're right in the Elway's going more to the short drop passing game. Jim Fossil's put that in. He, Elway's told us he loves it. First and 10 from the 48. And the first character, Rod Bernstein, and he sheds tacklers and picks up about nine. And we welcome those who watched the Colts and the Bills earlier today. Bob Costas with Joe Gibbs. Buffalo won on a day they honored O.J. Simpson at Rich Stadium for his 2,003-yard performance 20 years ago. Here, it's Denver with the game's first possession, and they've moved the ball well from their 20 to the 43-yard line now of Pittsburgh. Second and one there. Russell in motion. Bernstein the lone setback. They'll put it in the air on second and one, and they'll complete it for the first down. Shannon Sharp with his second reception, and Carnell Lake, the strong safety, with the tackle. I was a little surprised in that Denver had talked about running the football. This is the number one rush defense in the league, and we've seen Denver come out and do kind of what they want to do here, the short passing game and run the football. This is a, this is a very good opening drive and a good confidence builder right now for Elway and the guys. Shannon Sharp now has 50 receptions for the year coming into the weekend. Sterling Sharp led the league with 63. Sterling Sharp had a record 108 a year ago for Green Bay. From the shotgun, Elway zips it over the middle and completes it again to Vance Johnson. DJ Johnson on the stop inside the 30. Vance Johnson sent away to Minnesota, then cut by the Vikings 
just at the end of training camp comes back re-signed and regains the starting job and having one of his better years. This was a substitution here where they actually lined up Shannon Sharp on the outside with three wide receivers and that was on first down. Bob I think it caught Pittsburgh a little by surprise and they hit the end route on the opposite side of the field away from Sharp. They got almost exactly 10 close enough to measure. You see the two coaches there. Wade I, I got a big kick out of him when you, when you asked him Bob if, if there was a big difference now. Uh, with the baseball team being in town. And his statement to you, he says, no, he said the vice president was here last week, and he said they were still talking about my tummy ache. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. So, so football is still big in Denver. I wondered whether the Rockies being here and drawing over $4 million might have lessened the focus on the Broncos even a little bit. Apparently not. Tough situation for the Pittsburgh defense, almost a free down. Second and about a foot, and Elway will put it in the air. Well protected, but overthrows his man. Intended for Reggie Johnson. This is the area of the field where our quarterback has to start thinking field position and field goals. What he doesn't want to do here, uh, Bob, is get himself in any position where he would t get a sack or lost yardage that would take him out of a field goal shot because being at the high altitude, you got a real good shot of field goal from the 30-yard line here. That was always first incompletion on the drive. He's completing 65% of his throws this year, by far the highest of his career. Third down, less than one, and they got less than that. Bernstein carried it and stopped for a loss, if anything. Well, that's kind of what's got Pittsburgh into the situation where they have won six out of their last seven is their run-rush defense. And uh, this is a big decision here. You see Jim Fossil on the sideline. They moved him down here for the first time this year. He made the call and uh, get down the field where he can get closer to the players and closer to Elway is that's the reason he said that he felt like he should move down the field. The stop by Gerald Williams forces them to try a 47 yard field goal. Tommy Maddox to hold. Dave Wydell to snap and Jason Elam hits it long enough and perfect. So Elam, who had a short field goal and a point after blocked in last week's galling loss at home to Minnesota, where they blew a 20 to 3 lead, connects from 47, and the Broncos go up 3 nothing. This has got to make Wade happy this first drive. We were talking about the offensive co uh, coordinator there, Jim Fossil. He's actually on the field for the first time this year, and we had a little discussion about that. And he said Elway is so much into the game that he really doesn't like to talk to him on the phone when he's upstairs. And he was relating to us, Bob, that he likes being. Elway does being in the game and up and down the sideline and Fossil said hey in order for me to talk to him and be around him I need to get down the field with him. NFL next week on NBC the three early games and then in the second part of the doubleheader most of you will see Buffalo and Kansas City two teams with Super Bowl aspirations. At last check the Bears had taken the lead at Kansas City. Let's turn to Elliot Cow working stats in the booth with us and we'll try and get that score updated. Bob they uh, they may have stuck you with a rookie and you're coming back to, to doing some uh, TV here and doing game TV for football. But one thing they they did not stick you with a bad football game. I think we're going to have a heck of a ball game today. I'm excited about that. It's fun to watch something like this. We don't know what's going to happen today but this is important to both these teams. Jason Elam to kick off with Woodson and Stone waiting, and it's Rod Woodson inside the five. Woodson with some running room. Woodson down the sideline and finally forced out. After a terrific return, Charles Dimery gave him a little shove. Otherwise, it would have been more. A 35-yard return. I've got to really disagree with Mike Dick. I think that's the defensive player of the year right now. That's my vote halfway through right here, Bob. This guy, not only because he plays such great corner work, you see a great return here, but the fact that he can run these kicks back, stays healthy, that means a lot to, to a team, I'll tell you that. Welcome to those of you who watch the game between Cincinnati and the Jets. Bob Costas and Joe Gibbs at Mile High Stadium. Denver got a field goal on the game's first possession. First play from scrimmage for Pittsburgh results in a drop pass by Leroy Thompson, but a flag went down as O'Donnell was dropping back. I, th I think there was movement in the offensive line there, Bob. Full start before the snap. 65 offense. 
Gordon McCarter, the referee, 27 years in the NFL. Yeah, I've called him a lot of names from the sideline, Bob. <laughs> Over those years, those 12 years I was on the sideline, I called him about every name you could think of. In retrospect, with or without justification? Uh, I'd say that most of the time, uh, without justification. <laughs> Frustration, really, from the sideline. He does a heck of a job. He's one of the guys I do have a lot of respect for there, I'll tell you. Huge win for Green Bay, staying alive in terms of their playoff aspirations. Giants and Eagles just starting. Same for Raiders in San Diego. Thompson into the line for a short game. He's playing in place of Barry Foster, who didn't make the trip, and they don't know yet if he can play next week at Houston. John Jackson might be having a Pro Bowl year. A lot of people think Dermonte Dawson, the center, is the best in the league. I think you're going to look... Uh Look for uh, Pittsburgh to, to also establish a run in this first drive. Thompson has had over 100 yards each time he's filled in for Foster. If they go to their so-called Detroit set, then you'll see Adrian Cooper and the two tight ends as he'll join Green. Hodge and Thompson on second down and 11. O'Donnell to the air, over the middle, and he's got Eric Green, who had a huge game on Monday night against Buffalo. Six catches plus a touchdown, a gain of 16 there. And a first down. I think Ron Earhart definitely has a, a weapon here. Th this guy is a humongous uh, presence on the field. He's 6'3", 280 pounds. He also has a great athletic ability. And what he does, he gets some mismatches all the time with the defense. And uh, Ron Earhart told me that he's going he's to try and get him the football. Into Denver territory. Juggled but recovered by Thompson, and then he's immediately slammed down by Mike Kroll with help from Dave Wyman. I don't think you really have uh, a good feel for this ball. I think uh, uh, O'Donnell had to reach out. I don't think there was a good handoff exchange here. It didn't seem like he ever really got the ball. Good job by Denver right here. This will be one of the keys. Can they stop this rushing attack of Pittsburgh and still keep their safeties deep in the secondary so they can protect themselves against some of those big plays they've, they've had? Charlie Waters had a tough time the last few weeks here because they've given up big plays in the secondary. Bronco defensive coordinator, former Cowboys safety, of course. O'Donnell on second down, and it's batted away from Jeff Graham by Charles Dimery on a nice play. Demery, as we get a second look here, Demery makes a good play, just getting his hand just in front of this. And he actually came inside and made that play on zone coverage there, yet he kind of matched up in that zone and made a great individual play. Demery was out with a hamstring pull last week against Minnesota. His substitute, Frank Robinson, had an interception but was burned several times by Viking receivers. Now on third and 10, Hodges in in the backfield. Great third down back. Graham in motion. From the shotgun, lots of time for O'Donnell to the sideline, and Graham does a little dance trying to stay in long enough to get the first down. And he's close to it. A look at Denver's defense. There's the front seven. Mecklenburg, the great veteran inside, Kroll, the number one draft choice of a few years ago. Braxton and Dimery on the corners. And the hard-hitting safety, Smith and Atwater. If they go to their Tiger set, Lilo Lang comes in as an extra defensive back. And in that set, Mecklenburg will move up from linebacker to a down lineman. They'll go with a four-man front. They got the first down, and O'Donnell will throw on first down. Pumps once, now gets it out of there to Green, who is upended on a good one-on-one -on -one tackle by Tyrone Braxton. I tell you, that was a good job by Neal. Double cock, and he, he, he was ready to let that ball go, brought it back in. And got it down to Eric Green for a big play across the field. Watch him right here. Start to go full swing and off one foot. That was an athletic move by Neal in that case. Gain of seven, setting up second down and three. 6.30 to play in the first quarter. A Jason Elam field goal on Denver's first possession has them up 3-0. Kansas City lost at home, blowing the lead. They lost to Chicago. So they're now 7-3. and three. The Broncos are 5-4. and four. Leroy Thompson carries. 
and Thompson appears to have the first down. It's a good thing he got down because I tell you the, the safeties from uh, uh, Denver were coming up that time. Both these safeties, uh, I tell you, are big hitters back there and make a big difference. And they had talked about, Charlie Waters talked about getting Atwater closer to the line of scrimmage, uh, particularly in their coverages and some of their run support. He feels like they can do a better job if he gets him up close to the line of scrimmage. And uh, as, as we take a look, watch the safeties here on run support here. Right here, as you see Thompson with the ball, he got down just in the nick of time. Back live, another play action fake by O'Donnell, and his pass is nearly intercepted. Dennis Smith had it and dropped it. You see, three times in this first drive, Pittsburgh's trying to get the ball to Eric Green. They really think he's a, a threat. We talked to Ron Earhart. That was going to be a part of their game plan. And here he's trying to get a corner out. O'Donnell is, and really overthrow the, through this. This should have been intercepted here. Actually, Harry Green in that case is well covered. O'Donnell has thrown for nine touchdowns and had only four picked off. They play a low-risk offense that relies on the running game. They want to establish the run, even with Barry Foster out. You notice almost all the passes come off play action. A delayed handoff here to Thompson. Gets by the first tackler and then taken down at the 21-yard line by Charles Dimery, and a flag goes down. O'Donnell has done a good job. I think uh, all the coaches there were really bragging. I, when we saw him earlier in the year, he was concerned about tendonitis in his elbow. And uh, as we talked to him, that, that he's really kind of said, it's, I'm not going to be 100% for the year, but he feels good right now. There is no foul. The low block was committed about eight yards beyond the line. It is legal. No foul. The flag went down in error. The play stands. This is a draw play, and uh, Pittsburgh does a great job with the draws. And here you see Thompson breaking to the outside on this. Again, big shoes to fill today, but I, I think this guy, uh, in talking to him, he's got a lot of confidence, Bob, for not being in there much. He feels like he belongs. Tenth play of the drive, third down six from the 21. Merrill Hodge again back in. Just over five minutes to play in the first quarter. 3 nothing Denver. O'Donnell dumps it over the middle, and the catch is made for the first down by Ernie Mills. Tyrone Braxton tackled him, but too late. It's probably in one place on the field I hated to be as a coach. You're looking at first and goal from the 10. <laughs> this is tough, tough yardage down here. But I would say that Pittsburgh's one of the teams that's been having great success, as we've talked about. They've had 35 trips down in here, they have, and they've scored on 30 of the 35, Bob. That's tremendous even split between touchdowns and field goals in the red zone. Leroy Thompson to the five, but a loose football. And the Broncos recover at the five. Tyrone Braxton made the recovery. It looked like an Atwater hit that jarred it loose, and then Braxton cradled it. We get, a, we get a look here at the back starting right up, right at us, coming right at us, and it looks like he just really didn't have a, a good handle on the ball. Again, that's the second time in this drive, and we talked about Thompson filling in for Foster. He's done a good job, Bob, but I tell you, without a lot of experience in there, a lot of playing time, it's tough for him. So he puts it on the ground at the five, and Elway takes over again with the 3 nothing lead. Bernstein. Sweep turns the corner, lowers his shoulder, takes a hit. Got a good block from John Melander, and Darren Perry eventually stopped him. I've been a little surprised so far that Denver's been able to rush the ball against the number one defense, uh, rush defense in the league. And that's Lloyd down, one of their leaders, Bob, I think, on the field. Let's hope that's not anything serious. Greg Lloyd, the two time Pro Bowler. Terrific speed rusher from that outside linebacker spot. Yeah, I talked to him, and it was, it was great just visiting with him in the locker room and the personal touch there. He said, you know, my son's only four years old, and I go out to, to places with him, and people come up and ask me for my autograph. And he said that uh, he said that the people come up and ask him for an autograph, and his son says, hey, that's just my daddy. Why are you asking for an autograph? I think we're going to get another look at the uh, 
the right hand side of your screen right here you're going to see the injury as it comes up and it brings Bill Cower out for a look I don't blame him this is one of their leaders to this defense kind of looks like he was cut on that play let's hope that's uh, again nothing serious it was a gain of 11 and John Melander's block on Levon Kirkland was a key and again I think what they caught him in there Bob was a too deep uh, a look without their safeties up to support we expect to see a lot of that out of Denver but not as much out of Pittsburgh I think they were playing kind of cautious there and they got the seam on the outside take a look at coach Cower what a great job this guy's done uh, last year to put him in the playoffs and this year also here we may get a little better look at it right hand side of the screen where he gets cut down there uh, we saw that shot on the sideline of coach Cower I'm, I'm reminded of how tough it is in this league for a first year uh, coach uh, Bob I, I started out 0 and 5 and I was just looking for a different way home at night I told Pat, I said I don't want anybody to know where we live and this guy goes to the playoffs last year and wins a division you started 0 and 5 and 81 but won the Super Bowl the next year last year Cower was essentially the same personnel that had finished 7 and 9 in Chuck Knowles final year went 11 and 5 but they were sputtering at the end of the year and lost their lone playoff game 24 3 at home to Buffalo then they opened this year 0 and 2 with defeats against San Francisco and then being shut out by the Rams and people were shaking their heads since then though they've reeled off six out of seven as Lloyd is back up and off that's a good on his own power. I think the other thing that uh, they pointed out to us that there was a I think there was a, a newspaper strike during uh, Bill's first year and he said you know he really uh, again is getting another look at him being cut down here Lord being cut down but he said hey I think that worked to my my advantage that first year because there was not all the criticism and everything that normally comes to a coach and then this year when he started off he was having a tough time the criticism immediately uh, surfaced Rico Mack number 56 replaces Lloyd Elway after the half the distance penalty play action fires it out long and Reggie Johnson makes the catch behind Kevin Green. A 29 yard gain. So the penalty put them in the shadow of their own goalpost and immediately Elway on a first down pass off play action from the end zone clicks for 29. Well, this is a great throw with some risk to this now. There's a risk of a safety right here. But I tell you what, Elway's back quick and uh, we're seeing the tight ends are having a lot to do with this first quarter, I'll tell you, for both these teams. Elway's five of six in this first quarter, which has 320 left in it. Bernstein will try the left side and Rod Bernstein becoming more actively involved in their offense now when he came over from San Diego he admits he was a bit disappointed the first few weeks he wasn't getting the carries he had hoped for he'd still like to tote it 18 or 20 times a game that hasn't happened yet but they use him as a pass receiver and he is getting more carries yeah I asked him I said uh, first of all I asked him do you like playing he came up as a H back or tight end he says no I definitely like being a running back better when San Diego switched him and he said he likes to get the ball 20 to 25 times a game that hasn't happened yet but I think uh, Denver's looking to use him more and more I think uh, as, the, as the as the year moves on he got seven on that carry on second and three reflecting their new approach they set up in the shotgun over the middle and another completion into Pittsburgh territory tumbling catch by Derek Russell and a pickup of 17 Russell publicly taunted perhaps the best cornerback in the game right now Rod Woodson earlier this week he was quoted <laughs> as saying I think Woodson's been lucky <laughs> yeah, I think that would have been that takes guts now to to say anything about Rod Woodson. You see his confidence in making that kind of a statement. Here's the replay with just really a, it, it, again that was the three wide receiver set setting Shannon Sharp to the outside and again John Elway working away from it and getting an in route across the middle hitting it twice in this game so far. Sharp in motion this time but Bernstein gets the handoff and picks up extra yardage as he bangs into a couple of defenders Donald Evans eventually stops him. I tell you a good mix so far for Denver I tell you they're giving that ball to uh, Bernstein and uh, Elway's been extremely sharp. This again is a uh, kind of a counter hitting back to the other side you get a good picture of look at Bernstein what a hit <laughs> look at that guy start up the field like that with uh, some of the defenders bouncing off him for Pittsburgh this is one of the best tackling teams in the league right here and Rod Bernstein right now is, is running through him he got seven on first down again and they'll let him have it 
it once more, but this time the Steelers are ready for him. Gerald Williams there first. You're looking at a defense right here that kind of prides himself on people not being able to run the football. And, and to be truthful, Bob, this team has a good look about it. Pittsburgh does. Uh, history gives us a thumbnail sketch of what a Super Bowl team looks like. Stop the run, which they can do, and run. And play, and both their, their kickers right now are very hot in their special teams. Greg Lloyd has a bruised shoulder, but as you might have seen, he is back in as of the last play. Nice. Movement along the line. Flag goes down. Elway rolling right. The ball batted back in his face by Kenny Davidson. It was Davidson who sacked KO Jim Kelly of the Bills on Monday night at Three Rivers. Now the question here, did Elway actually head bob? See if his head bobs on this. Let's take a look at it. Does it? A little bit. The question becomes uh, to the referees, is that a head offside. bob? Is he trying to draw him offside? Or is Five guys. First down. The referees decide to go with the fact that uh, they think Pittsburgh jumped on that. I guarantee you Pittsburgh right now screaming from the sideline. Coach Cowers yelling, hey, look, the head bob, the head bob. Elway's great at that. One of the veteran guys is great at that. So that makes it first down at the 29, last minute of the first quarter. This drive started back on the five. Elway steps up and throws. He had his man. And Derek Russell had to reach out and try and one hand it. Now, one rap on Elway always has been that he zings the ball too hard, sometimes unnecessarily, and he's bristled at that. And with his increased completion percentage, this year he asked the press a couple weeks ago, how come you guys don't say I can't throw the touch pass anymore? But he didn't have much touch on that one. I agree with him, Bob. Hey, throwing the ball hard, that's what the receivers want. They don't want to sit down there and wait for a ball a long time to get killed. They want somebody to put the ball and get it there in a hurry, and this guy can do it, and I think that's an unfounded criticism. I like quarterbacks that can throw hard. Missed an open man that time, though. Second down, 10. Pumps once. Fires incomplete. That'll bring up third and 10. Let's look at Elway's numbers. Last year, one of his worst, statistically. But look at this, almost a three to one ratio of touchdowns to interceptions. For his career, he's just about even. Coming into this year, he had thrown just about as many career interceptions as touchdowns, and he'd never had a season with a ratio any better than one and a half to one. This year, it's three to one. His top career touchdown mark, 22 in 1985. He's on a pace to throw 30 this year with 17 already. Third and 10 from the 29. Backpedaling, locked in one out, and it's caught by Derek Russell. It'll be first and goal, Denver. There is a flag down at about the 40-yard line. I think that's going to be against Pittsburgh for roughing the passer. Bob, that was a big blitz coming off the corner. It was Rod Woodson. Watch him come off the corner. See him coming down and kind of mistimed it. An excellent job by Denver picking it up. A great throw by Elway and a late hit on the quarterback. That's going to give him the ball. Roughing the passer, 94 defense. Give him the ball After on the one-yard line. The Great play by spot. Elway. First down, goal to go. Chad Brown, the rookie out of Colorado, is the guy who made the late hit. So they pick up 26 on the catch and run. That took it to the three. They move it another yard and a half. First and goal from there. Del Pino is in there. As we get another look at the touchdown, this is a this is an excellent job here of getting up in the air and getting over the line of scrimmage and over the defensive players that were in a low goal line charge. Del Pino does a great job of getting up high and getting over the top of the line charge and the short yardage goal line. Elam makes it 10 to nothing, and consider this turn of events for Cower and the Steelers. After they stopped the Broncos in Pittsburgh territory and made them settle for the Elam field goal, they drove down to the five, but Thompson fumbled and Braxton recovered there. 
Then the Broncos put together a 95 yard march on which they have to convert a third and 10 from the Pittsburgh 29 and now they're up 10 nothing with 11 seconds to play in the first a 95 yard drive against the number one defense in the league. I tell you that that is uh, that's big time. And the thing that I had a question of Bob is how much did that Monday night take out of Coach Cowher's team uh, playing that kind of a game almost uh, air free very physical and then to turn around and travel all back all the way back out here. I thought the uh, I thought the emotion part kind of would have to go to Denver in this game. You'd have to kind of give. I think Denver was sitting here ready and mad about what's going on. Welcome to those of you who watched the Oilers beat Cleveland 27 20 at Cleveland. Bob Costas with Joe Gibbs at Mile High Stadium. The Broncos with 11 seconds to play in the first quarter lead it 10 to nothing. Jason Elam kicks off after a Robert Del Pino touchdown and Rod Woodson takes a knee in the end zone with five seconds to play. So doubly bad news for the Steelers. The Oilers after a horrible start are playing very well now. They win at Cleveland. They host Pittsburgh next week in Houston and they go to Pittsburgh on December 19th. With the victory they've moved to within half a game of the Steelers who lead the AFC Central at six and three but trail here ten to nothing. We did the uh, Seattle Houston game uh, two two weeks ago Bob and that's the one thing that Houston was already talking about if they can get on a little bit of a roll and still get to play Pittsburgh twice. They felt like uh, that things were still in their hands. Houston's now won five in a row. Play action fake by the backpedaling O'Donnell. And then he flips it out to Leroy Thompson, who's dragged down by Greg Craven. This. A loss of two on the play, and the first quarter comes to a close at Mile High Stadium, 10 0 Broncos. Monday night at Three Rivers, Pittsburgh completely shut Buffalo down, winning 23 0, held them to 157 yards in total offense for the game. In the first quarter, Elway, you see him there with the offense coordinator Jim Fossil looking at pictures. Elway and the Broncos had 141 total yards in the first quarter. Remember last week, Pittsburgh had the ball 45 of 60 minutes against Buffalo. Denver had it 9 9 37 of the first quarter. O'Donnell on second and 12 as we start the second nearly slips gets back up and throws incomplete for those of you just joining us Denver on the game's first possession got a 47 yard field goal by Jason Elam Pittsburgh moved the ball smartly down the field when they got it but a fumble at the five yard line by Leroy Thompson was recovered by Tyrone Braxton of the Broncos and then Denver went 95 yards for a touchdown capped by Robert Del Pino's one yard dive to make it 10 zip. Third down 12 from the 18 yard line. O'Donnell with lots of time complete to Merrill Hodge but well short of the first down as Darrell Hall pushes him out. Kansas City lost at home after having the lead against Chicago. That's good news for Denver. You see, a, you see a look at, at uh, Neil really couldn't get the ball downfield at all, O'Donnell. And so he had to take a check down, and that's not going to help you when you're looking at uh, having to pick up 12 yards. Mark Royals has averaged 42.4. And here's Glenn Milburn, the rookie out of Stanford. Very dangerous. Milburn sheds one tackler and is around midfield before being run out of bounds at about the 49 yard line a 43 yard punt a 15 yard return and already leading 10 nothing excellent field position for the Broncos early in the second the NFL on NBC is brought to you by Domino's Pizza call Domino's Pizza now and you'll be enjoying our new crunchy thin crust pizza during halftime If the Broncos win today they'd move to within a game of Kansas City in the AFC West but Kansas City owns a victory over the Broncos this year with one remaining to play and Casey is 4 and 0 within the division so they have the tiebreaker advantage the Raiders who have an early 3 nothing lead against San Diego could also move to within one of Kansas City with a victory but they've already been swept head to head in two games this year by KC because the Raiders lost to the Chiefs at the Coliseum last week so Kansas City still in the driver's seat. Elway on first down 
Someone got a hand on it. It flutters into the arms of Shannon Sharp, it was quickly taken down by the strong safety Carnell Lake. Denver going with the no huddle. I don't know how much we'll see of this because Pittsburgh was so terrific shutting it down when Buffalo tried it on Monday. Elway scrambling. Tucks it in and runs. Goes down before he can take a hit. And he's very close to the first down, just outside the 40-yard line. They'll spot it at the 42. You see the competitiveness there in Elway. He goes head first trying to get that first down. This is a guy that's been around a long time. Most guys, most coaches try and encourage the quarterback to go feet first. But you see his competitive part of Elway coming out. And he goes head first. It's, it's something that we've kind of, uh, it's been a great change up here, I think, by Denver. They're coming out with four wide receivers. In that case, they didn't even have anybody on the backfield. That was a first and ten play, which has kind of surprised me a little bit. And several times they've been in there with three wide receivers or four wide receivers on first and ten. A real change up here by Fossil and uh, the Denver Broncos, uh, letting Elway kind of uh, go for it on first and ten. Fossil was a player at USC when you were the offensive line coach there in the late 60s, right? You would have to mention that. That makes uh, you feel like makes something of a feel fossil, like... doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does, particularly when I meet his son yesterday, who is uh, 18 years old and getting ready to head off to college. And I was telling Jim, you know who else was on that? Uh, there is a court young quarterback, Mike Holmgren, on yeah. that staff. I, uh, it makes me feel uh, rather old yesterday in the locker room talking to Jim. Later, Fossil was the quarterback coach at Stanford when John Elway was a freshman there. So they're reunited here with Fossil as the offensive coordinator under Wade Phillips and the new regime in Denver. Third and less than a yard. And they move the pile enough to get the first down. Elway did it the simplest way. And they go with the hurry up once more from the 40 yard line trying to build on a 10 nothing lead. Elway stepping up into the pocket and floating one out to Milburn. Lynn Milburn, change of direction, and a good open field tackle by Dion Figures. Their number one draft choice, the rookie from nearby in Boulder. He went to Colorado. Denver doing a great job, as we've already mentioned, mi mixing things up. They now have Glenn Milburn in there at the running back instead of Bernstein, and they're in sets here to throw the football on first and ten. This is a four wide receiver set right here. Inside handoff to Milburn. He's not going much of anywhere. Stopped by Gary Jones. It was Jones who delivered that clean but wicked shot that just about splattered Don Beebe on Monday night in Pittsburgh. Yeah, we really didn't think we'd see a lot of the no huddle, as you've already mentioned, Bob. Uh, Pittsburgh stuff. Buffalo, who's probably the best in the league at no huddle, but, but Denver's doing a good job changing up and using some of it. Second and ten, staying in the pocket, and Elway has it dropped on him by Derek Russell. As we take another look here, you'll see that uh, Elway back and really a crossing route. You see the receivers crossing underneath, trying to open things up, and they got what they wanted, just a flat drop. He had beaten Rod Woodson, the man he taunted earlier in the week, calling him just lucky. Here you see the receivers crossing underneath, and you see the other receivers crossing behind as the, as the, the interior of the field was kind of cleaned out by the underneath crossing routes, opened up the in route, but... Uh, Third and ten Had from the 26. Elway throwing on the run. Caught by Vance Johnson for the first down. But there's a flag down. And a holding call against the Broncos will bring it back. This is the area on the field that we talked about, Bob, where you do not want lost plays, sacks or... Holding, number 75, offense, 10 yards, repeat third down. Or a penalty, which is what, what happened here. Now you're looking at a, a uh, being taken out of field goal range right here, and that's the one thing that Denver never, did not want to do. You're looking for points. That guy right there doesn't like, doesn't like what happened to him right here. Well, he doesn't. Brian Habib, the free agent acquisition at right guard, the former Viking, nailed for holding. He had a crucial holding call against him last week against the Vikings, which negated a big gainer and was one of the factors in the defeat as they blew a 20-3 lead and lost for the second time this year at home. A rarity for them. Elway can't get away. Spun down by Carnell Lake back near midfield. 
That was another attempt, Bob, for Elway to draw Pittsburgh off sides because you could hear him all the way up here in the booth with that hard count, even in shotgun. He's been around long enough. He can do that. Watch him right here. Watch his whole body kind of go forward as you uh, get that snap count. And uh, but in this case, he could not elude the uh, pass rush. And he did not draw Pittsburgh off sides. So Ruin is in the punt. Woodson is the lone deep back. And they'll let it bounce into the end zone. It goes for the touchback. That is only the third in 20 that Mark Royal has had bounce into the end zone. He's been a, doing a fantastic job all year on that, Bob. I was ruined, I'm sorry. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Starter, authentic apparel and headwear of the NFL. By Keystone, Keystone Light and Keystone Drive. Bottled beer taste in a can, wouldn't that be great? By Hager wrinkle-free cotton pants, 100% cotton, 0% wrinkles. And by Acura, some things are worth the price. Bob Costas back with Joe Gibbs at Mile High Stadium, 11-19 to play in the second quarter. The Broncos lead it 10 to nothing. Cowers Steelers without Barry Foster. Thompson and Hodge are the running backs. Dwight Stone in motion. Leroy Thompson gets the carry. And after getting some good blocks, he does the rest of the work himself. A very different runner than Barry Foster. Foster, a punishing straight-ahead runner. This guy, a little shiftier. Yeah, on the replay here, we see a real quick change of direction. We saw that the other on the Monday night game. This is the first time that they've really been able to break outside. This is one of the things I was looking at as far as matchups, Bob. The tight ends uh, for Pittsburgh are big, very strong. Can they handle the outside linebackers? If they can, Denver's going to have to get their safeties up to try and stop the run. A gain of 16 for Thompson, who's carried six times for 35 yards. Play fake to him. O'Donnell in trouble and sacked by Simon Fletcher. Back to the 30 and a loss of six. The first sack of O'Donnell today. You see O'Donnell right here on the play fake. Everything's looking like they're going to the right. He was trying to bootleg back, but Simon Fletcher was not fooled. Made a big, big defensive play for Denver. I tell you, I got great respect for that guy right there, Ron Earhart. He went up against us when he was with the Giants all the time, and that guy was a thorn in our side. Bob, week after week, he came up with great game plans against our, our defense. O'Donnell can't get away yet again. Carl Mecklenburg, the 11-year man out of Minnesota, once a 12th-round draft choice, went on to become one of the great linebackers of his generation. They play him some at down linemen in their Tiger defensive formation. That's the case here. And he bursts through for the sack. We were talking to him, and uh, he was telling us, Bob, he does not like playing down, but yet here he makes a great play from the down position. Uh, he said he likes to be standing up, pictures himself more of, a, uh, more of a linebacker, but in their Tiger set, when they're going to nickel, he actually plays down, defensive tackle, and he's very light to be playing in there at that weight. Yeah, just 235. It's third and 21, and Pittsburgh takes a timeout. I didn't want the quarterback to come over in third and 21, 31 to me. <laughs> we'll step aside for a moment. As we come back to Denver, here's a look at the natural gas quarterback efficiency ratings. This is coming into today's action. We don't know what a size and get in the Jets' win over Cincinnati. Elway of the Broncos, third in the AFC. Last year, he was 65.7. This year, up to almost 97. Here's O'Donnell on third and long. And his pass is caught by Eric Green, and two defenders take him down. Well short of the first down. A gain of 13, but they needed 21, and Royals will have to come in and punt. I tell you, the crowd noise came in there, Bob, and, and uh, when I was watching practice on Thursday, Pittsburgh was simulating that because they were practicing in the stadium where they could use crowd noise over the loudspeakers to get them used to this noise, but we could hear it all up here, and that made a difference right there when Neil O'Donnell was trying to get that snap. Royals kicks it away. Milburn at the 10. Glenn Milburn. 
across the 20 a return of 11 yards stopped by Reggie Barnes a 51 yard punt by Royals an 11 yard run back by Milburn the Broncos with the ball and a 10 nothing lead four of their last six games after today are on the road speaking of the Broncos there is always a huge gulf much larger than for the average team between the Broncos efficiency at home and on the road. So this is a must win situation for them. Bernstein gets the pitch and the carry for a couple of yards on first down. Yeah the best best winning record in football. People hate coming here because of the high altitude. And here you see the little pitch coming to the outside with Bernstein turning up and uh, trying to get on the corner. But I used to hate coming here Bob the high altitude the fans. Uh, this is a tough place to play as an assistant coach. I used to get winded just getting up here to the press box. <laughs> Broncos are 97 and 32 at home since 1977 by far the NFL's best. They're well beneath 500 on the road in the same span. Elway zings one to Derek Russell and Russell has the first down to about the 33. As we see the pressure here on Elway, he does a real good job. Just a little de delay route on the outside. They've used this formation quite a bit, but you hear you see the price the quarterback pays for playing in this league. It's uh, high risk and high rewards. <laughs> you get paid a lot of money, and you get knocked around also. Elway 10 of 14. And you see the yardage to this point with 742 to go in the second quarter. Keep it on the ground on first down. Bernstein stacked up after a gain of maybe two we talk about the high rewards Elway having his own car dealership and everything he's got going in the community here he does a lot of community service work as we take a look at him there I asked him I said hey with that car dealership do you ever get any nasty letters he said believe me everybody that gets a bad car or something happens to my car he says I get the letter across my desk uh, but it was kind of fun talking to him about that. And it, it's great seeing somebody like that having this kind of a career in this kind of a town, a high profile guy. I wonder if John has time to go around and check transmissions during the season. <laughs> Second down eight from the 34. Rolling away from that little bit of pressure, then jumping it to Bernstein. But Rod doesn't get much before Levon Kirkland takes him down. Gerald Williams was also there. I've noticed that since the roughing the passer call on Chad Brown, the rookie from Colorado hasn't played. So Dom Capers and Bill Cower have pulled him. No sooner do I say that than he comes back in for this third down play. Here's a look at the last play to Bernstein. This is going to be a little underneath screen. You saw the fullback there trying to set himself up. He steps up in the pocket, trying to make it look like he's blocking, and then just slides out underneath the lineman. And uh, in that case, uh, Pittsburgh did a good job of covering it up. Third down six, 6-17 to play in the half. 10 nothing Denver. Elway fires one deep, and it's caught by Shannon Sharp. Did anybody touch him? He gets back up. Foot race to the goal line, uses the stiff arm, and down to the one. Loose football in the end zone. Recovered there for a touchdown. Derek Russell trailing the play. Scoops it up for the TD. Sharp is shaken up, and so is a Steeler player at the back of the end zone. DJ Johnson is the Steeler player down. First of all, a great catch. Then he realizes he hasn't been touched, and he pops back up. Yeah, that was one of those mismatches we talked about where Denver's trying to get Shannon Sharp matched up on somebody that has a bad. Uh, a speed re relationship with him. He got him on the outside that time, but actually he was covered there. He just made a great play, Bob, and uh, let fumble the ball as he went in the end zone. But uh, uh, I tell you, it was, it was a great reception, a great individual play. He was actually covered here. DJ Johnson drilled him from behind. The ball popped free, but Russell, alertly trailing the play, scooped it up. Looks like Sharp's okay, and it's 16 0.
here comes the field goal unit for the second time. Vicky was not out of the pocket. Johnny Greer, the referee, determined he was not throwing the ball away to avoid losing yardage. This is a three-step drop they get a sack on. Boy, that's, I, I don't know. The new rule says that if you roll out of the pocket, then you can throw it away. He was right behind the center when he threw that one. We understand we have some technical difficulties up in uh, Mile High Country. We welcome those watching Pittsburgh, Denver. This is Jeff Jager, short field goal try for the Raiders, and he boots it through. The second field goal for Los Angeles, the lead 6-0, but disappointing for Shell. Long drives, short field goals. Not a good theory. We apologize. We lost horsepower at Mile High for a bit. The only thing you missed was Jason Elam's point after that puts the Broncos in front 17-0. Now Elam kicks off with Woodson and Stone deep and through the end zone for the touchback. Let's take a look at the 63-yard play. That's what they called it officially. We're going to get a good look here of man-to-man -man coverage. You see everybody matched up here man for man. Uh, and that's what Pittsburgh's going to be playing all day. And actually, in this case, Figures has very good coverage on Shannon Sharp. Watch him on the outside. Run right with him. Uh, but in this case, it was just a great individual play by, by Sharp. They're going for a mismatch here, but, but Figures has great coverage. It's just a great individual play. And then Sharp being sharp enough to get up right here and run with him and score with him. Bob, I was laughing. They were, had a picture of the Mustang there when you said horsepower. We lost horsepower. From the 20 yard line and trailing 17 0. O'Donnell gives it to Thompson, who struggles for a yard. Now, Pittsburgh did come back. There's a flag down. Did come back earlier this year to beat Cincinnati 24 16 after trailing 16 0. But that was against the winless Bengals. And holding, holding against call. Pittsburgh. Holding number 87 offense, 10 yards, repeat first down. I think you'll see on the right hand side of your screen here where we get the holding call. Adrian Cooper, the guilty party. I tell you, Denver's been impressive uh, on, on defense. They're scrambling and getting to the ball and doing a heck of a job right now against Pittsburgh. So it's first and 20 from the 10. Denver up 17, but remember they led 20 to 3 last Sunday here at home and somehow lost to the Vikings. O'Donnell to the goal line, out to Merrill Hodge, who's drilled down at the two. Kroll got there first. Lilo Lang came in for good measure. We take a look at uh, O'Donnell back here, and again, he's done a good job during the day of looking around. He can't find anything. Did a good job of getting rid of that ball, but very alert play by Denver also. Bob, you mentioned the uh, the fact that they have been a big comeback, and Denver has given up the ball here in the second half in a couple of games here at home and took losses. I think that's one thing you're going to see today. They're mentally going to try and set themselves so that they don't give up big plays to Pittsburgh and get them back in this game. They run it on second and 27. And Thompson, maybe four yards across the five-yard line. Greg Cragen makes the stop. We were talking to Charlie Waters the other day about Cragen. Says he's playing extremely well, but he has the kind of attitude where he believes he's going to be cut every day. <laughs> yeah, Charlie said to us that this guy is one of our best football players. And every time we have a meeting or talk to him, he always feels like he's going to be cut. Take a look at him inside. You see that nose guard? That is a great play. I tell you, you've got great respect for guys that can play that position. Third and 24. Exactly four minutes to play in the half. They hand it to Hodge, and now they'll punt it. Dennis Smith gets credit for the stop. Darrell Hall was also there. Darrell Hall and all the rest feeling their oats. Up 17-0. And about to get the ball in pretty good field position. Yeah, they got it going their way right now. The fans and everybody else, they like the looks of this. Royals puts his foot into it. Good kick. Drives Milburn back almost to the 30. Stutter step across the 40. Spun down at the 45. 
Tim Jordan the tackle. 55 yard punt, but a 13 yard run back. All Denver in this first half leading 17 nothing and with the ball at their own 45 yard line with just over three minutes to play until intermission. We saw Glenn Melbourne run that punt back for him. We were talking about mistakes. He's one of the guys that made mistakes last week fumbling the football. And I noticed right there he was making sure he covered it up Bob. And uh, when we were talking to him he's very sharp aggressive rookie. And he said, hey, I just messed up. I'm not going to let it happen again today. Stripped of the ball at the 21 of the Vikings when they were driving for perhaps the winning touchdown of the tying field goal in the latter stages of the ball game. And then with 12 seconds to go, fumbled a punt to deprive them of one last desperate chance. This will be Rod Bernstein on a first down carry, fighting for two and maybe three. Don't forget at halftime, Jim Lampley, Mike Ditka, the Domino's Pizza Halftime Report, and congratulations to our colleague who works out of the studio, O.J. Simpson. They honored him today in Buffalo, roughly the 20th anniversary of his 2,000-yard season, and you can't forget, he did it in 14 games. Eric Dickerson eventually had more total yardage, but he did it in a 16-game season. The Juice that year had more yards rushing in 13 of Buffalo's 14 games than the Bills did passing. Second and seven from the shotgun. Elway, lots of time, has his man. Derek Russell making the catch, and Russell is shoved out at the 26-yard line. They are closing in on 270 yards at this point in total offense in the first half on the number one rated defense in the league. We take a little, another look at Elway. Doing a good job of finding Russell across the middle. And like you said, what's impressive here, this is not against, this is against the number one defense in the league. Number one against the rush, number two against the pass. So this is quite a feat right here. Denver's got it on a roll right now. Two backs, two wide receivers. Bernstein the carry. Picks up a block, lowers his head, and dives forward near a first down. They've consistently made good yardage on first down, which has put Pittsburgh's defense in a bad position because Denver's likely to throw it on second and two, second and one. As we take a look at this, this is a counter play uh, where you see the lineman pulling, and it's actually a long trap there. A heck of a job. Yeah, I, I tell you, so far, Denver, I don't think they could have been much more impressive right now, particularly against who they're going against, Bob. Two-minute warning. We'll be right back in Denver. Tonight, an around-the-world spectacular Disney's Countdown to Kids Day, followed by an all-new Sequest adventure starring Roy Scheider. Then, it's an NBC world premiere movie. On the surface, they were the all-American family. Behind closed doors, their true story will shock you. A family torn apart. Don't want to miss that tonight. Pittsburgh's defense has been torn apart, shredded by Elway and the Broncos. They get the first down, it appears, on a Robert Del Pino carry. They needed less than a yard, and they have a first down inside the 15. I think the crowd's a little nervous here. Last week they made some mistakes down inside, down inside the 13, and they're wanting them to hurry up here. Trying to coach them on. Reggie Johnson goes off rather gingerly. They tell us they're checking his right thigh on the sideline. A minute 25 to play until halftime. Denver looking to increase his 17-0 lead. Bernstein has the pitch but not much yardage. Rod Woodson among those who met him. Woodson leads the league with seven interceptions. He's gone to four straight Pro Bowls. He's also one of the league's most dangerous punt and kick returners. And another part of that, Bob, he's a big leader in the locker room. You get the feeling when you're there visiting with him that most of the guys in the locker room turn and look to Rod Woodson for leadership. And uh, he's just... Uh, he, he's a very valuable part of this football team, and I, like I've said, I think he's the most valuable defensive player in the league. This is second down and a long eight. Rushes on, and Elway just gets rid of it. Kevin Green was coming in hard on him. We were talking to Green yesterday. 
He says he remembers a game here in 1988 when he was with the Rams and he had a wide open shot. It was a blown blocking assignment for the Broncos and he had about a 10 or 12 yard head of steam and truly splattered John Elway who simply bounced back up patted him on the rump and said nice play and Green says I've never forgotten that. This is a bust here also I think Bob you see uh, Green coming this that's the number one guy that they're looking at to pass protect. I don't know how they could have blown that assignment. This is a guy you never forget on pass rush right here. He's a relentless pass rusher. Third down nine. Elway looks left gets rid of it to Milburn and Milburn is brought down from behind at the nine and they'll have to settle for the field goal. Chad Brown made the tackle. Denver will let the clock run down here and actually by not calling timeouts there they used up that the full uh, first half time. They'll let this run down and then kick the field goal and won't leave Pittsburgh any time left to do anything with it. Pittsburgh so it now stops the clock. It was good strategy on Denver's Denver's part. When we come back Elam will try and make it 20 to nothing. Thursday at 3.30 Eastern, Don Shula, the NFL's all-time winningest coach, leads his Miami Dolphins against Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin, and the world champion Dallas Cowboys in a battle of interconference powers. It'll be a Texas-style football feast with all the trimmings on the NFL on NBC Thanksgiving Day. If Jason Elam connects on this field goal, the Broncos will have scored on four of five possessions in the half. Two touchdowns, two field goals, and the one time they punted, they had gotten into Pittsburgh territory before they had to kick. 27-yarder is good. Nine seconds to play until halftime. 20 to nothing. You knew coming in that this was a tricky situation for Pittsburgh. A short week having to travel to mile high. Denver in a near must win situation after already losing two home games and having four of their last six on the road hanging on by a thread in the divisional race and maybe even in trouble in terms of their wild card chances. Pittsburgh coming off a very emotional performance Monday night at home. These are the kinds of things that coaches worry about. What sort of effort, what sort of mindset am I going to get from my players? Now Cower is one of the best at getting a team ready to play. Emotion typifies his teams. That's been the case from the start. But look what's happened today. They have been totally dominated. Yeah, they really have. I, I think that was one of the questions. How much did Monday night take out of them? Uh, could they get back to that emotional level? Denver, in the meantime, is sitting here mad about what's happened to them this year, having lost two at home, and had a mindset of, of, of really going after things. If I if I was uh, going to bet on this game, I think I'd said I'd hate to bet against Denver. If you bet on them later in the year, I kind of like Pittsburgh with all the different things they can do and run in the football and the fact that they can play great defense. So I would lean that way later in the year if they come back and play each other in a playoff. Elam just bounces one down the middle of the field. Woodson comes up to grab it and scoots out of bounds. Pittsburgh has five first downs in the first half and they got four of those on their first possession when they got down to the five yard line before Leroy Thompson fumbled the ball away. This has been in every measurable way Elway's best season. I think the fact that uh, he's so excited about the change in coaches and all that really means really Bob is maybe it was time for a change. But he gets a new coordinator in here. He feels like when you talk to him he's got more things to work. Jim Fossil right there you're taking a look at is the guy that's directing things. And there's just a real excitement on his part. He loves it. That'll do it for the first half. Of course when I say it's always best season that's in terms of individual stats. He has taken three different Bronco teams to the Super Bowl. And they came in today only five and four. So in terms of the team it hasn't been their best. We're back after this from your local station. Broncos dominating in every imaginable way and leading 20 to nothing just before the start of the third quarter. Considering Joe how well Denver played overall maybe this is stretching the point but they were only up three nothing when Leroy Thompson fumbled the ball away at the five for the Steelers and it might have been a different first half had that not happened. Yeah it could have been stepping in for Barry Foster and Barry Foster is pretty sure handy guy and uh, 
that could have been one of the things. But, but to tell you the truth, Bob, it's been pretty much Denver in every category. As an example, uh, they're averaging 7.5 yards on first down, and Pittsburgh's averaging 1.6. Rod Woodson has driven to the back of the end zone by Jason Elam's kick. And so Pittsburgh will start to work at the 20-yard line. Ron Earhart, their offensive coordinator, who reprised that brilliant game plan that worked in Super Bowl 25 against Buffalo when he was the offensive coordinator for Bill Parcells and the Giants. More or less the same approach, somewhat different personnel, but the same time of possession type thing Monday night against Buffalo's high-powered offense. And they held the ball for almost 45 minutes. The biggest disparity in time of possession in an NFL game in more than two and a half years. But that's not the way it's gone in the first half here against Denver. O'Donnell will throw it on first down. And he'll pump it long down the sideline for Dwight Stone, and he stayed with it. After the ball had been deflected by Tyrone Braxton, Stone, with great concentration, twisted halfway around and made the catch in Denver territory, a pickup of 37. This is a play that's flat covered. Look at that. But great concentration and an acrobatic move, too, almost bending backwards and doing a, a, a very uh, gymnastic Almost a backflip right here. And look at the concentration on the stone hanging on the ball. And actually trapped it on the top of the shoulder pad, though. Stone's first catch of the day. O'Donnell to the air again on first down. And this one is juggled by Stone. So he makes the very difficult catch and then comes back and drops the easy one. Yeah. The, you, you, we say easy on that, but that slant play like that, I tell you what's going through those receivers' minds right here. I'm going to get killed. <laughs> when you come inside like this, you're, you're coming in to see the safeties and everybody's starting to converge there. Those are tough catches, that slant route. Those are tough catches. Yeah, Tyrone Braxton was fixing to drill him in the back had he made the catch. I think Atwater was coming from the other direction. Second and ten. Thompson will carry. Off left tackle, extra yardage as he stays on his feet. Credit Mike Kroll with the tackle. I think that's a good example of the big tight ends from uh, Pittsburgh getting after the Denver outside linebackers. And that's what Charlie Wa uh, Waters, that's one of the things he was worried about. And what he's playing is a game there with his strong safety. Keep him back and protect against the run. I think that's what you'll see now because they have a big lead. But that's the problem with that. If you stay back, then they get the run off tackle on you. You know, Eric Green hasn't really burned the Broncos, at least not yet. We've got a full half left. O'Donnell to Green. <laughs> way, way to go, Bob. You can call him. You can call him. Listen, I, I think this is one of the real exciting things in football when you get a mismatch like this. Now, take a look at this guy. This is like having a Winnebago lined up <laughs> in the slot where a receiver is supposed to be. That little, the nickel back there comes out and says, I'm supposed to be defending against a 150-pounder. He looks up and there's 280 pounds of athletic man looking at him. That's a, that's a great picture and a great mismatch. The tight end for the Broncos, Shannon Sharp, has equaled the reception total of four for Eric Green. Thompson on the ground inside the 20. The last catch by Green was good for 17 yards. You know, what makes Green so difficult to defend, it's not just the size, but he's uncommonly fast for a man of 280 pounds. Yeah, what, how, do you, how, do you, how do you cover him? That's a tough question. And here is Cragen from the nose guard position again. We've been talking about him. Charlie Waters loves him. Listen, I want to tell all the parents out there, if, if your son comes home from Little League and they tell you that he's going to play nose guard, withdraw him from the program. Mamas, don't let your boys grow up to be nose guards. They're going to get killed. On second and eight, O'Donnell throwing for six and overthrowing Eric Green, who had gotten behind Mike Kroll. Now, sometimes they'll cover Green with a safety, and other times they'll put a linebacker with the speed to drop back into coverage like Kroll on him, and Kroll had the assignment here. Yeah, we'll take a look at this, and that is the question. Linebackers have a better chance of getting their hands on him and being physical, but also in a foot race there, you can see where Green was starting to pull, pull away a little bit. That's the problem you have. Who do you put on him? Linebackers, he, he normally can outrun, and small defensive secondary guys he can shove around. Here's a huge play. A field goal just wouldn't feel right on this drive for the Steelers. They need to get back in, and O'Donnell chased out of the pocket and throws it away, and they'll have to settle for a three-point try. 
It's a good job here by Don really looking at him. And actually, we can uh, take a look at this, I think, and get a good look at a safety blitz. It's a good thing that Neil was moving here because you see the safety on, on the outside. You can see him starting to move up, and then all, all of a sudden you'll see him blitz on the outside. O'Donnell was able to get away from it and do a good job of scrambling around. You see the two safeties coming from the inside here. Gary Anderson tries from 37. And the fourth most accurate field goal kicker in league history behind Pete Stojanovic, Nick Lowry, and Morton Anderson. Gary Anderson hits from 37, and the Steelers at least are on the board. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Mazda. Mazda, it just feels right. By the people at Nike, who encourage you to just do it. By Compaq Computer Corporation. And by Sprint. We've got everything you need, local, long distance, and cellular, to let you be there now. Bob Costa's back with Joe Gibbs, 12.02 to play in the third quarter. Steelers trailing 20-3 after the Anderson field goal. And now Gary will kick it away to either Russell or Milburn. And Russell's going to let it go out of bounds for the five-yard penalty. Kickoff out of bounds. Receiving team will put the ball in play at the 35-yard line, first and 10. Take, take a look at the, two, the blitz again. Both safeties, this is a gamble by Denver up the middle, both of them coming, and it pays off here because they put pressure on O'Donnell and make him scramble out of the pocket. We want to clarify that for you and show the gamble, and a heck of a call by Charlie Waters. And that proves, by the way, that it has been 10 years since I did an NFL game. That was the old rule. They accept the ball at the 35 <laughs> under the new rule. Leading 20 to three. And Bernstein for about five. Jeff Sconina on the stop. The only time they punted, they actually got fairly deep into Pittsburgh territory before a holding call and a couple of incompletions forced them to kick it away. Two touchdowns, two field goals. Del Pino a one-yard dive. And the touchdown comes on a 63-yard pass from Elway to Shannon Sharp, who was hit at the one, fumbles it into the end zone, and Derek Russell recovers for the TD. Quick fake and a bullet of a pass off the hands of Vance Johnson, the lone remaining amigo from the glory days of the Super Bowl years. This is going to start to get interesting now. And, that, and that, on that play right there, Pittsburgh was blitzing from the outside in man coverage. A great job of the corner closing here and gets a great hit. You're going to see Pittsburgh start to gamble more. They are geared to that anyway because they have corners that can play man-to-man -man coverage. They're going to start coming after uh, Denver and trying to make something happen here. Now that could also, they could also give up big plays doing that. Dom Caper is the defensive coordinator watching from on high. into Pittsburgh territory. He came right back to Vance Johnson. That again was a blitz. That's just what we were talking about. Pittsburgh now is starting to sell out and go after uh, Denver. In that case, Elway makes them pay. Let's take a look at it here. Both inside linebackers coming. Denver does a good job picking it up. And, and the danger with that is when you blitz, you are man to man. And take a look at the route on the outside. He beats Dion Figures, who from his knees makes the tackle. Figures out of Colorado won the Jim Thorpe Award a year ago as the top defensive back in the nation playing for Bill McCartney and the Buffaloes. Denver on the move again. Bernstein. Delpino got the touchdown, but we really haven't seen much of him running from scrimmage in this game. Looks like Rod may get one of those 20 carry days he was talking about, Bob. They make him happy. He was brought down there by a mini herd of Buffaloes, two Colorado rookies, Figures and Chad Brown. Brown is the guy with the collection of snakes, which he keeps in a warehouse in Boulder, some 175 snakes he poses with boa constrictors wrapped around him. <laughs> Once had his hand nearly gnawed off by a nine-foot python while he was dangling a live rat into its cage for its lunch. <laughs> Mistook his hand for the snack. Down the sideline, a flag goes down. Shannon Sharp came down with the ball out of bounds. And let's see what the call is. They're waving him on down. Looks like pass interference against the Steelers. Yeah, is it an offensive pass interference or is it going to be defensive pass interference? Pass 
interference, number 21 defense, automatic first down. Maybe it could have gone either way, but the way this game has gone, it figures that it would be against the Steelers. Okay, you now what, what Figures is doing here is a good job of trying to force the receiver towards the boundary. He did a good job, but he just didn't play the ball. And we're seeing that the Colorado players today, we got Figures, Steed, Solomon, Cooper, Brown are having a tough homecoming here, coming back to uh, back to Colorado. I can never, I can remember the very first time I went home in pro ball. It cost about $350 in tickets because I bought everybody tickets. I didn't realize it's not like college. They don't give them to you. From then on, my wife, Pat, said, I will handle the tickets from now on. And for the rest of the time I was in pro ball, when somebody called me for a ticket, I said, call Pat. And she didn't give me any out. <laughs> she watches the Bucks better than I do. Are we sure that career in pro ball is completed? <laughs> You might look good in that black and purple of the Carolina Panthers. I see you're going to start all that again, the rumors. They told me I could trust you. <laughs> Here's the handoff to Del Pino, and Del Pino with a change of direction down to about the two. He got 14, so Pittsburgh comes out on the first possession of the second half and at least they get a field goal but Denver comes roaring right back down the field yeah we used to try and sell our players at halftime here's a look at a heck of a run by Del Pino here getting getting down low and making a good cut in line of scrimmage that was all runner he cut that thing back but we like to sell at halftime the first five minutes of the second half sets the tempo we saw Pittsburgh do a good job with the drive now it's Denver coming right back and answering first and goal from the two and Del Pino Gets about half of it. Before we get letters from the Charlotte area, I guess their <laughs> colors are black and teal, not purple for that NFL franchise, new expansion team that will begin play in 95 with one more to be named at the end of the month from among Baltimore, Memphis, Jacksonville, and St. Louis. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. At the end of the month, somebody else is going to be thrilled, and I guess about three towns are going to be upset. Del Pino and Bernstein behind Elway. Into the end zone goes Del Pino. Well, Darren Perry, number 39, came up to meet him from the free safety spot, but Del Pino just overpowered him and took it in. I think that was a great run. It was actually a blitz off the corner there, and he did a great job of actually just making a guy flat miss him right in the hole. Elam knocks it through. It goes to 27 to 3, and we'll be back after this. Make NFL Live part of your Thanksgiving Day. Jim Lampley, Mike Ditka, O.J. Simpson, and Will McDonough will report direct from Dallas before Don Shula and the Dolphins, who won again today. Despite all those injuries, they're down to Steve DeBerg at quarterback. They've gone to 8-2. and two. Meanwhile, Dallas surprised at Atlanta. They'll be in a foul humor when Jimmy Johnson leads them onto the field on Thursday. Kozar started at quarterback today, and the Falcons really put it to the Cowboys in Atlanta. Woodson from the goal line. Do the Broncos have it? You bet they do. Reggie Rivers came out of there with the ball. As we take a look at it here, you can see Woodson, he actually left his wedge there and kind of veered off, trying to make a big play on the outside. And really had the ball kind of in front of himself there. Really didn't have it tucked away, Bob, I think. And you, you get a look at a heck of a celebration on the sidelines, huh? Del Pino, a moment after scoring his second touchdown, realizes he and his mates are coming back out to play offense again. Leading 27-3, looking to put the game away right here. Elway to the end zone. 
broken up. Russell was behind the defender. But Dion Figures got back into the picture to knock it away. Yeah, that was that was a corner round. I think you'll see Elway. He put some air on this. He probably get a little too much on it. And he get uh, too much height and not quite enough distance. You can see there the Figures makes a heck of a play getting up in the air to about that thing away. They had a heck of a shot right there. The corner route. He's actually behind the defenders there. So second and ten from the 13-yard line. Elway for six once more. There it is. Vance Johnson. As we take a look at this, you're going to see that this is press coverage. In other words, the corner's tight on Johnson. And what you really like for him to do is stay a little farther away from that, even though he's pressing him, because that gives you that little fade route right there. And most quarterbacks in this league are very effective, and particularly John Elway, at throwing that. Every reason to celebrate up 34 to 3. Vance Johnson's TD catch, and then Elam's extra point makes it 34 to 3. Miserable afternoon for Woodson and the Steelers. Dominated here every bit as thoroughly as they dominated Pittsburgh, uh, Buffalo on Monday night in Pittsburgh. You know that guy right there? I'd look for him to. I bet he storms this thing out of there if he gets it. I bet you that. He's upset. Elam's pumped up too, though, and Woodson has no opportunity to bring it out. Here's I'll tell you what you're going to see right here. You're actually going to see a, an audible by the receiver. You normally see quarterbacks audible. And look at Vance Johnson. Look in and tell Elway, hey, look, I got press coverage. Give me this, give me this shot on a fade right here. I got one-on-one -on -one with tight press coverage. See him pat his head? They go in motion. Elway sees him. That's actually an audible by the outside receiver. Great call by Vance Johnson and great teamwork there. Uh, and you see Wade react to that. He likes that. Not surprisingly, Vance Johnson has caught more John Elway touchdown passes in their respective careers than any other Bronco receiver. Leroy Thompson carries here. Simon Fletcher among those who hit him. Kansas City had a lead at home on the heels of their great victory a week ago at Los Angeles. Had a lead at home against the Bears, but the Bears came back to beat them. That drops Kansas City to 7-3. and three. Obviously, Denver can pull the win in a game if they win this one, which they apparently will. And if the Raiders beat San Diego, they'll also be a game back. But Kansas City is 4-0 in the division. They've already won both games from the Raiders, and they won the first of two from Denver. So all the tiebreakers belong to the Chiefs. Time out, says O'Donnell. Look at the look on Earhart's face. How can everything go right six days ago and everything go so wrong less than a week later? On three Jeff Jager field goals, the Raiders lead at San Diego in the third, nine to nothing. Stan Humphreys is at quarterback for the Chargers. We got it all going to Denver, including the wave right now. This is going to be tough for Pittsburgh. Barring a comeback for the ages, they will be in a first place tie at six and four with Houston. Houston has won five straight after a horrible start. And the Steelers go to the Astrodome next week, maybe without Barry Foster again. Here's Foster's replacement, Leroy Thompson, taking that little swing pass and getting something close to first down yardage. I think the ball flies out of there again on Thompson. He's going to have to keep that ball tucked away. In this case, Eric Green was there to scoop it up, but uh, I think they gave him forward progress. A little swing pass coming out of the backfield. I think uh, O'Donnell's done a good job all day of kind of looking downfield. If he doesn't have something, this is his third 
option right here, doing a good job of hitting things like that and getting the ball off. Great block by Eric Green also on that play. Gain of 10 on the nose. First and 10 from the 30. Here comes Mecklenburg. He's got him. The years and knee surgeries have slowed Mecklenburg down, but he's got the savvy and the moves, and he has two sacks today. Here we're going to see the pass rush coming, and actually, in this case, O'Donnell didn't have a chance to get out of there. We were talking to Carl yesterday, and he was saying that I asked him about, uh, I think you did, Bob, asked him about that Super Bowl game that we had in San Diego, and he said he still remembers one of the big plays he thought was when he sacked Doug Williams, he thought he would hurt him and got a fumble, and they ruled it that we were down. Thank goodness for me, or I wouldn't have one of these Super Bowl rings on right now. Well, wait a minute. The score was 42-10. Maybe you could have withstood <laughs> an extra touchdown. There's Eric Green with a catch at midfield. And a pickup of 28. We're going to see, uh, in this case, he was he was playing in the traditional tight end spot. You see him get off the line of scrimmage here with nobody really holding him up. You'd like to get more of a, a hit on that guy. Do not let him come off the line of scrimmage like that because he's a big target downfield, and O'Donnell found him right in the middle of the coverage. You need to hold him up, bang on him at the line of scrimmage. Don't let him off like that. Trailing 34-3, to three, they give it to Leroy Thompson. Things haven't gone all that well for Thompson today. He had the first quarter fumble at the five-yard line, but both times Foster has been hurt this year, once against the Saints, and then Monday night against Buffalo. Thompson has come in and rushed for over 100 yards, and he said it's really a good feeling to come into that huddle and not see concern and worry on the faces of my teammates. They know that I can come in and do the job. Even so, and he's rushing for five yards a carry today, even so, you can't go through that playoff stretch, that run for the postseason, and feel confident without Barry Foster, who didn't make the trip to Denver, and they won't know until early this coming week whether he'll play next Sunday at Houston. Here's Thompson. Lost the ball. Looks like Denver's got it. The question is whether the ball touched the sideline before the Denver player had possession, in which case Pittsburgh would keep it. Well, pressure has anything to do with it. The referees are getting coached from the Denver sideline. They're over here on this sideline. They're doing a good job now moving away and talking about it. That's the third fumble that we've seen uh, Thompson lose. And I, I think it comes with experience of being in there and having carried the ball a lot. Uh, this is a lot to put on his shoulders. The ball belongs to Pittsburgh. The man who recovered the fumble had been out of bounds, came back in, but did not reestablish himself with two feet in bounds. Therefore, the ball remains with Pittsburgh first down. The rule here says that you cannot go out of bounds and come back in and be the first one to touch a ball. And I think that's what happens. You feel so bad for Thompson. They're running like mad. Great effort. He's run strong all day. You mentioned, Bob, he has a five-yard average. And here you can see where his foot was out of bounds and did not come back in and reestablish it. He had two foot, feet in there. As Cole was making the tackle, Smith, Dennis Smith, stripped the ball. And Atwater at first had a clean shot at it. Might have been thinking about picking it up on the run and scooting the other way instead of just falling on it. And then as he pushed it forward, one foot went out of bounds before he recovered it, so a break for Pittsburgh, which they desperately need. And there's a completion to the sideline to Dwight Stone from O'Donnell. We take a look, another look at play action fake and just an outright to out route on the outside to Stone. You know, in these situations, it looks kind of like it's, it, 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 it's, it's a very tough situation for Pittsburgh to be in. But this is a time as a coach I used to like to look out there and see who was playing their guts out. Even when it looks like we may not have a chance. This is a good time to evaluate players right here. Thompson will carry. Mecklenburg missed him, and he gets good yardage on the play inside the 20. This guy has ability. I tell you, he's made people miss, and he's got ability. And I think probably just a lack of, 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 of a number of carries. He's let the ball get away from him. And watch, watch the blocking now on the left side. Uh, a little cross block on the outside. You see the tackle come to the outside, and he winds up on the outside linebacker and does a heck of a job. 
how did uh, Mecklenburg get all the way out there? Really not fair to say Mecklenburg missed him. He was trying to fight no. off a block by Merrill Hodge. Good numbers for Thompson. Penn State product in his third year in the league. They give it to him once more. And he's very close to the first down. On the same weekend where he had 109 and a touchdown on national TV on Monday night, his former Nittany Lion teammate Gary Brown of Houston had 166 against Cincinnati. So a good weekend for the Joe Paterno products. And they'll see each other this coming Sunday at the Astrodome. I sense right now that Thompson may be tired too. Look at him with his hands on his hips. That comes also with not having played a lot. You may be in great shape, but when you get in there with the pressure and the excitement of a game like this, you have a tendency to get tired. I think he's tired right now, Bob. Third and less than one, and they might not have gotten that. There, there's our, our, our nose guard showing up again in the middle of the defense. And uh, I really had the feeling here that that uh, that Thompson was tired at that point. And I'm not so sure that he kept his head up there. He kind of put his head down and went for it. Let's take a look at the at the play inside. This might have been Mecklenburg making the play. It was a combination of he and, and, and Craig and both. Heck of a play there by your nose guard. Coach Cowher saying, hey, we're going for this. They need less than a yard. 220 to play in the third quarter. And you're trailing 34 to 3. This is in the category of a no-brainer. Thompson again. Looks like he got it. Now, as well as Thompson has played every time he's gotten an opportunity, these third and shorts, fourth and shorts, these are made for Barry Foster with that quick explosion into the hole and that punishing running style. Yeah, something inside that requires a lot of strength. Uh, I, I think also, I think that the wear and tear here, this is a dangerous time to get the ball to Thompson because I think he's tired right now. They'll put it up on first and 10. Merrill Hodge makes the catch. Mecklenburg the tackle at about the 10 after a gain of three. I was talking to... Uh, Merle Hodge in the, in the locker room the other day, and I was laughing because I said, we used to love to go to scrimmage, you guys, when Chuck Noll was there because it was such a Spartan existence at Latrobe. We'd go over there with our players and scrimmage in the morning. We'd go in to lay down the dorms. They didn't even have air conditioning when Chuck was there. And we used to come back from that, and I'd say, see, you guys got it pretty good here with the Redskins. Those Pittsburgh guys are tough. They don't even need air conditioning. Moving along the line. They complete the play. Donald tosses it over Hodge's head and then appeals to McCarter for the call. Merrill Hodge had perhaps the greatest game of his career in a playoff game here at the end of the 89 season in January of 1990 against the Broncos. He rushed for 120 yards and caught eight passes, but Denver came from behind to beat the Steelers. 24-23. Pittsburgh had gotten in the playoffs at 9-7 and seven as a wild card, upset the Oilers in an overtime game at the Astrodome and then nearly upset Denver. That was Denver's last trip to the Super Bowl. They beat Cleveland the next week in the conference title game and then were blasted 55-10 in the Super Bowl by San Francisco. And O'Donnell wants to talk it over. I think the play clock had run down on him in, in that case. I think the crowd had a big, big factor in that with that early snap on the last down and then uh, Neal didn't get him back to the line of scrimmage in time to run the play. They're facing third and seven from the 10, trailing 34 to three with 58 seconds to play in the third quarter. Hodge is also the backup for Thompson, and uh, I'm surprised that he really hadn't got to carry the ball a little bit here today just to kind of spell Thompson, get him, get him uh, fresh again on the sideline. On Tuesday night, our old buddy Broadway Joe Namath will be on the John Larroquette Show at 9 Eastern and 8 Central. Joe and his teammates from the 1968 New York Jets who won Super Bowl three in upset fashion in January of 69 against the Colts were honored at halftime of the game against Cincinnati. Silver anniversary of that stunning achievement. So Namath who has a little bit of acting experience stage work and in a few films will be on the Lara Keck show on Tuesday. Adrian Cooper in motion on third and seven. O'Donnell in trouble, trying to get away and can't. Simon Fletcher drags him down. 
That's the fourth time O'Donnell has been sacked today. I think in this case, uh, you see a isolation here of Simon Fletcher on the pass rush here, doing a great job. Most great pass rushes are relentless. Watch him here. He was actually stopped and blocked, but they never stopped. Those great pass rushers never stopped. Kevin Green, Simon Fletcher, those guys always keep their feet moving and keep moving towards the quarterback. The second effort normally gives you those sacks. Fletcher and Mecklenburg have split the four sacks, two and two. And now Anderson splits the uprights. But it's very small consolation, making it 34 to 6. Anderson has been close to unerring this year. He's hit 20 of 21 field goals. We saw Coach Cower on the sideline there, and we talked about uh, Coach Knoll when he took over, Bill Cower. Even though they're very different off the field, in other words, I think Coach Knoll had a lot of interest in music and wine and sailing. Uh, Bill Cowher is pretty much a family guy, stays at home, pretty much business-like. Uh, but on the field, their teams are very similar. I, I see a lot of Coach Knowles' philosophy. It was great defense, we know, run that football, a quarterback that made great decisions in Terry Bradshaw. I see a lot of that in the teams right here being coached by Bill Cowher. It's almost like we're revisiting those years. Not that having a good day today, but. Last year, though, in the 11-5 and five turnaround from 7-9, and nine, Coward saw six of his Steelers make it to the Pro Bowl. One more than had made it to the Pro Bowl in the last four years under Noel combined. It's funny, my very first Pro Bowl I got a coach it was all the way back in uh, about 1979. And you know who was there with nine Pro Bowl players? Pittsburgh. They had nine Pro Bowl players in, in that game. A fantastic, you know, Bradshaw and, and uh, Mel Blunt and all the guys that uh, captained those teams and Franco Harris, uh, Franco, Swan. Franco Harris. Well, they were the Super Bowl champs. Most of those guys either are or will be in the Hall of Fame. Derek Russell on the return and stopped short of the 20. Rico Mack made the tackle. 17 seconds to play in the third quarter. I asked Bill Cower yesterday if he had an attitude about coming to Denver. Some teams like to arrive a little early, get acclimated to the altitude others say why make your players feel that it's anything special they came in on their normal schedule got here about six o'clock Rocky Mountain time but he said look whatever I've tried against Elway it hasn't worked when I was with Cleveland <laughs> when I was a coordinator at Kansas City John Elway has cost me a lot of money and brought me a lot of heartache and I don't even want my players to know my personal history at mile high and with John Elway well, that history has gotten a lot worse today as they trail 34 to 6. This will be the last play of the quarter with Rod Bernstein bringing it across the 20. I've always found with, uh, I found that whether it was weather or altitude, the best thing to do is let the players go through just a regular game plan and that week and don't harp on something because then you'll get it mentally in their mind that there is something special about it. Power trails 34 6 back after these messages from your local station. Highly unlikely that Drozdov has made a trip to Kristoff, the <laughs> presidential hairstylist. He is inactive for today's game, a rookie defensive lineman out of Maryland with an interesting history. Yeah, and in the preseason game we were doing, he comes out, he's all nervous in the first play in the second half. He threw up all over the center and the ball. And we had a great shot of it. NBC cameraman did a great job of getting that shot, Bob. But I, I was so nervous. I was upstairs doing my first practice game, and I said, <laughs> Darren has a nervous stomach, and he talked about many times when he goes in, that happens. But it was a beautiful picture. I shouldn't say beautiful picture, but it was a picture of him throwing up on the ball well you know and I thought that was a first NBC cameramen pride themselves <laughs> on being able to document a moment like that from several angles <laughs> Darren also has tattoos all over him. that comes as a shock to me <laughs> third down and six from the 22 we start the fourth quarter the Broncos lead 34 to 6 look out here comes Kevin Green and we spoke earlier of the great respect he has for John Elway, and he shows it there, helping him back up and patting him atop the helmet. Yeah, 
Let's take another look at that. This. this is a great pass rush by a great pass rusher. He's actually standing up this time, which is unusual for him. But I'll tell you what he did right here. I really think that he was getting ready to put Elway away. Elway made a great athletic move just getting down because I think he saved himself there. He was getting ready to get a face mask right underneath the chin. So Tom Ruin will punt from near the goal line. Steelers put a rush on, but Ruin gets it away. Woodson calls for a fair catch, then lets it bounce. And it's a good Denver roll to about the 33. Credit Ruin with a 54-yard punt. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Pontiac and your local Pontiac dealer. We are driving excitement. By Schick Tracer, it traces every curve on your face. By Hewlett Packard Laser Jet and Desk Jet Printers. And by Coca-Cola Classic. Always the real thing. Always Coca-Cola. Jason Elam, the place kicker. Tom Ruin, the putter. The most recent Denver kickers are all with Dan Reeves with the Giants. Brad DeLuiso, Mike Horan, David Treadwell all there, as is the outstanding inside linebacker Michael Brooks following their coach to the Giants. O'Donnell back to work for the Steelers. Fires one down the middle and it drops incomplete. Stone was the target. For the sake of perspective, the greatest comeback in a regular season NFL game come back to victory not to make the game close or take a lead that was ultimately relinquished again 28 points San Francisco was down 35 7 to New Orleans in 1980 won the game 38 35 of course the biggest comeback overall regular season or playoffs from a 32 point deficit just this past year in the playoffs the Bills were down 35 3 at home and came back to beat the Oilers in overtime 41 38 Merrill Hodge will carry so the Steelers trailed this one 34 to 3 they're now down 34 6 with almost all of the fourth quarter remaining this is that little draw we saw several times in the first half as we look at, at coach Cower there we get a little replay here O'Donnell just kind of slides back gives the ball off this this play is tough to stop in long yard situations and Hodge, Hodge does a good job getting outside on it now we're to four wide receivers for Pittsburgh. Third and three, inside handoff. Got just what they needed for the first down, as Hodge, who always excels in third down situations, got the three yards. Again, a different form of draw, this time from a shotgun look. You get a good picture of that. One of the things I would say that uh, about Pittsburgh, Bob, I, can, I credit their front office with keeping this team in a good position and feeling good about themselves. One of the things they've done is, is sign most of their top Pro Bowl type players or top line players. I'm talking about guys like Rod Woodson and, uh, and Neil O'Donnell, Kevin Green, Barry Foster. Foster and Woodson signed after the season started. I think they got their Pro Bowlers signed. I think the front office has done a good job of that. They did a great job in the draft. They got a lot of the young rookies signed and I think that's what we're going to see in the future with free agency. You're going to see teams if they handle themselves the right way the way Pittsburgh has they're going to sign the Pro Bowl players and have a lot of young guys that make less money making the team and that's what we're going to see is, is the future I think with free agency. They're not going to have many guys in that middle category or older players that make a lot of money. Steelers got the first down as you saw after the measurement. O'Donnell to the sideline and Stone didn't stay in. Tyrone Braxton on the coverage. Some folks might wonder why down 28 points. O'Donnell would still be in the game. Why not give Tom Zach some snaps? What's your thinking? Well, I think right here, I think I think uh, Coach Cowers feel like they still got a chance. They're going for the ball here, ball game, and I don't think you're going to uh, you see a, a good shot on the sidelines of, of not getting the feet down in bounds. But I, I think they're, they're still in the ball game here. You can't say that to your team. You're not backing out of this thing. I think they got the players in there going for it. O'Donnell, good protection, and it's intercepted. Lilo Lang picks it off. He was trying to hit Eric Green, and Lilo Lang stepped in. 
But take a look at uh, O'Donnell going back on, on the play. Tries to get the ball inside. You can see him here delayed. It wasn't a clean route. He had to wait a little bit. And it gave the defense a chance to, to step in front. Get another look at it from uh, O'Donnell's position. You can see where he's trying to go here with the ball. The Don James product, fourth year man out of Washington, Lilo Lang turns in the play. And Elway hands the ball to Bernstein, who struggles to midfield, maybe for a gain of one. And we can ask the question in reverse at what point do we see Tommy Maddox with Wade Phillips? thinking about pulling John Elway. Well, I used to get criticized by that lots of times about not pulling our starting uh, quarterback. And really, what I thought, Bob, is it doesn't do a, a backup guy. Uh, uh, it doesn't help him a lot to go and just hand the ball off. That's what you're going to do right here. And uh, I used to want to get the game over with, keep my front line guy in there and get it over with. They'll probably come a point here where I substitute. But in this case, they're still throwing the ball. And still completing them. Vance Johnson covered by Rod Woodson and first down yardage inside the 35 but you can look at it another way Chad Brown was putting a lot of pressure they were blitzing putting a lot of pressure on Elway and with the game well in hand you run a risk of getting your franchise guy hurt yeah there's two sides to it there's no question I, I, I think that uh, Elway what a great throw huh? on a favor out again throwing it right behind his shoulder in other words he's actually throwing that ball behind the off shoulder of his receiver where the defensive man cannot get close cannot get it even though he's playing good coverage a pitch to Del Pino who has scored two touchdowns today Del Pino to the outside and he got about nine Maybe a little more than that. It's right near the chain. He was looking down, I think, trying to keep, get his feet just behind that marker. And you see how close he is there. We were talking about that free agency a minute ago, about the fact that Pittsburgh's done a good job of signing their all-stars and the rookies. They've got to fill in at the other spots, and that's what we're going to see in the future. I'm still surprised that the, that the players signed that agreement I think there's going to be a big shock this coming year when a lot of guys will let go Bob down the road I think that was a it was a mistake for the players you think the superstars are going to make ever larger cash but the good players or the middle level players might be uh, hurt by it more than they realize and I think that the, the superstars that have played for a long time for somebody is some place where we used to carry guys the extra two or three years at the end of their career you can't do that. If a guy's making a lot of money, they're going to see that their careers are cut short. You got a guy that, uh, uh, for instance, I had guys like Art Monk and Russ Grimm in Washington, and we kept them for another year or two, and they played backup roles, and they were still making a lot of money. You're not going to be able to do that when this free agency kicks in this next year. I think it's going to be a shock to them and a shock to the players uh, when the reality sets in. Clock winding down to 10 minutes to play in the game. Denver has 101 rushing yards as a team. Only the second time any team has done that against the Steeler defense this year. And the first time was a fluke. Cincinnati did it. And Jay Schrader had a 31-yard scramble at the end of the game to get them over that figure. Here, Denver has done it as part of their game plan. Although the most important part has been that possession passing game. They have hit a few big ones, including the 63-yarder to Shannon Sharp. But mostly under this Jim Fossil-developed Offense, it's shorter drops, less complicated reads, more passes to the tight ends and the backs, and a lot of passing on downs and situations where previously you might have expected them to run. And I'd say if the experiment of bringing Fossil down the field, I, I think we, this game is, a, is an indicator, and we're going to see him down there the rest of the year. On third and eight from the shotgun. The ball is knocked away, but a flag goes down. Dion Figures broke it up, intended for Shannon Sharp. Was it offensive or defensive? It looks like it's going to go against Pittsburgh, and that's going to be the second time that pass interference has been called on Figures. He was trying to defend Shannon Sharp. Pass interference, number 21 defense, automatic first down. 
This is tight press man-to-man -man coverage. And you see, Figures does a good job of making the receiver run an arc to the outside, but right there, he got his hand out on the, on the receiver. Now, the key point here is, was he looking back? I think if you look at that, it was kind of close. I think that one could have gone either way, Bob. I think it was a pretty good play on Figures' part there. But he did a good job of forcing the receiver to run an arc. That's hard to throw when you run an arc towards the sideline and try and get him close to the sideline and get him out of bounds. Steeler coaches are going to cringe when they look at the game film from this one. Bernstein stopped for no gain, maybe even a small loss, and a flag goes down. Speaking of Shannon Sharp, as we were a moment ago, he had a $20,000 bet. <laughs> Holding against the Broncos with his brother Sterling, right. who set an NFL record a year ago by catching 108 for the Packers. A bet as to who would catch the most this year. And Shannon realized Holding it was a sucker Number man. 85 offense, 10 yards, repeat first down. He realized it was a sucker bet, and he told us, well, we called it off. He let me out of it. But then we find out that Shannon actually had to buy his way out of it <laughs> for something less than 20 grand, but still a considerable sum. Now, Sterling Sharp caught seven passes today for the Packers as they beat the Lions. He now has 70 for the year. Shannon at this moment has 52 catches with four in this game. Last year, Shannon Sharp caught 53 and still had less than half the total of his brother who had the record 108. Glenn Milburn fighting, but he can't get outside. Yeah, I asked uh, Shannon, I said, let me ask you something. Even though you guys are good friends and buddies and all that, his brothers, they, they really love for each other, care for each other. I said, did you all fight growing up like my two boys did? And he said, you bet your life. This is Glenn Melbourne on a draw play. Does a good job breaking it outside. I was, uh, Glenn and my buddy, I was good buddies with my son, Coy, and I went to fly yesterday to see the big game, Stanford and Cal. I was, uh, Cal really did a number on Stanford and uh, got a chance to see Bill Wallace there like I normally do. And it's tough to see him suffer through a year like Stanford had this year. But Glenn and my son were good friends. It was good seeing him. And he told me to wish Coy the best. Here's Del Pino on second and 13. Coy is a linebacker for Bill Walsh at Stanford. They lost big against Cal yesterday. What kind of game did Coy have? Well, I think uh, Coy's had a – it's tough. He gets down because they've had a tough year all year, uh, Stanford and, and – they got a fantastic coaching staff, of course. Bill Wallace, one of the best that's ever coached, and it's been a struggle for all of them. <laughs> Many times when I go to those games and I'm sitting in the stands, I'm looking at Bill Wallace, I know why I'm not coaching. Because, <laughs> you know, there'll be things that two weeks ago there was a punt right in front of Bill that went five yards. And after the game, he looks at me and he goes, what was that, a five-yard punt? <laughs> all the things that can happen to you as a coach. I feel pretty good sitting in the stands realizing it can't happen to me. They just beat the play clock. But Bernstein, or Mega Del Pino, is immediately drilled by Woodson after he makes the catch. Do you second guess Walsh at all? Never. Uh, what a fantastic job he does there. I would never do that. Here's a replay uh, we see of the, of the pass here at Elway, incomplete. Oh, it was complete. complete but just for a short and, uh, game. So. for a short game, but forces a field goal in that situation. This will be a 28-yard attempt. And that increases the lead to 37 to 6. Thursday, Don Shula, the NFL's all-time winningest coach, leads the Dolphins against Emmett Smith and the world champion Cowboys. An NBC football feast, Thanksgiving Day. With the Broncos in front, 37 to 6. About halfway through the fourth quarter, Bob Costas back along with Joe Gibbs. You mentioned your son Coy playing at Stanford by 1995. He will be done, and you candidly tell me he doesn't have pro prospects. So the time I could be say ripe. That. I said I might go for him. <laughs> Somebody I can talk into it, maybe. Time might be ripe for this. <laughs> Carolina <laughs> Panthers. Are you trying to get rid of me? Just I would like to hang around in TV. Are you trying to get rid of me? Is Just try to increase your career options. <laughs> Rod Woodson on the return. Let me say, let me say this. I feel, I think Coy has a chance, and he thinks he has a chance at pro ball. We'll see what happens. We'll be back. 
Hard to tell if Tommy Maddox is smiling about the prospect of playing or just the general euphoria over the pasting they're handing the Steelers. Next week on NBC, this slate of games, and most of you will see Buffalo and Kansas City. Buffalo bouncing back from the loss on Monday night at Pittsburgh to win today. So they're 8 and 2. Kansas City losing at home to the Bears. They're now 7 and 3. This game obviously with multiple playoff implications. The Broncos will be at Seattle. And the Broncos will be within a game of the Chiefs in the AFC West. Here's a pass from O'Donnell, complete to Eric Green. And the big tight end is near a first down. The Raiders are still leading at San Diego, 9 to nothing. And so they, like the Broncos, will trail Kansas City by one in the West. But at the risk of being repetitive, we say this for those of you just joining us, all the tiebreakers belong to Kansas City. They swept the season series from the Raiders. They've won the first with another matchup still to come against the Broncos and they're 4-0 in the division. Ernie Mills dropped the pass. Frank Robinson had the coverage. I think one good thing about uh, this Denver team, Bob, we need to mention is the fact they're a young team. The average age of this team is a little over three years. And uh, I think they've done a heck of a job here in the organization. New coach, uh, a lot of new players, like 20, over 20 players or Brand new players of this team. They've done a good job. And they got those few leaders like Elway and some of those guys. So I think both these teams are definitely going to be around the playoffs. The catch is made by Eric Green, and it's not often that Green will get the worst of a one on one confrontation. But Steve Atwater, a legendary hitter, leveled in there. I, I definitely I think we can say that either one of these safeties for Denver, either Atwater or Smith, will both tag you. Third and short, O'Donnell scrambles for the first down, staying on his feet and then slides down at the 42. Atwater's reputation, which is based mostly on merit, was also enhanced when NFL Films mic'd him for a feature. And he was yapping all day in a game against Kansas City and then really leveled Christian Okoye. And that enhanced the reputation because players all around the league see that stuff. They see it and respect him. Look at this, a little stiff arm there by Neal. Pretty good move, and he got down the right way for a quarterback in open field, sliding, and you're not allowed to hit him. Looking for Jeff Graham. Let's take a look at what's ahead for these teams. It'll be second and 10 with 5.05 left, and the Broncos leading 37-6. to six. They go to Seattle. Then they're at San Diego, a home game against Kansas City, which will be a must. At Chicago, Tampa at home, and then on January 2nd, they finish at the Coliseum. Four of their last six on the road. And the Steelers, who now will be in a first-place tie with the Oilers, have two left against Houston starting next week at the Astrodome and including December 19th at Three Rivers. Pass complete to the sideline for Ernie Mills. And the clock stops at 4.58 as he gets out of bounds after a gain of 17. Well, I think, as we said, I think uh, Pittsburgh caught Denver on, uh, I think, really an inopportune time for them. They had a great game, great performance. Denver had set their job. This is one they had to have. And with what happened to Kansas City, they're right back in this thing today. That's got to make everybody here in this stadium happy. Pittsburgh came in here at a tough time on a short work week. First down from the 40. O'Donnell overthrowing Stone. Now, that's an example right there, Bob. And we've, uh, Charlie Waters, we talked to him. They took a lot of heat around here over the last few weeks, and there's losses about having breakdowns in their coverage. He said they simplified things, and you see a shot of there of Charlie on the sidelines. Simplified things, and he was worried, of course, that they've busted some coverage. Today, they've been very sound. They've set back. They do not have the kind of corners that you can play a lot of man coverage. So they have to play a lot of zone. And so they're actually geared to make less mistakes than, say, a Pittsburgh. And today we seem to be very proficient. Second and 10 from the 40. Sideline pass again to Mills. And again out of bounds with Frank Robinson in the vicinity. We got a shot a moment ago as we were focusing on Waters of Ernie Stautner, who was the defensive line coach for Wade Phillips here in Denver. Stautner, former Steeler great, was with Pittsburgh 
30 years ago this week toward the tail end of his great career and we mentioned that because there's been much talk this week along with all the other aspects of the 30th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy talk of the NFL's decision to play games that weekend Leroy Thompson carries it was third and two they had to get to the 30 and Denver thinks they didn't I'll tell you what somebody better get a chain on that one <laughs> he's trying to kill guys Joe Foss the AFL commissioner canceled the games the Oakland Raiders then coached by Al Davis were to have played in Denver the Broncos that year finished 2 11 and 1 the Steelers did play against Mike Ditka's Bears Chicago would win the NFL title that year for George Hallis beating Ali Sherman Y.A. Tittle and the Giants in the title game 14 10 at Wrigley Field they played a 17 17 tie on November 24th 63 broken up by Charles Dimry and Dimry was thinking about the possibility of picking it off and scooting unmolested down the sideline and Wayne gave him a high five on the sideline you got your head coach giving out high fives on the sideline great break on the ball right here did a good job of batting the ball away came close to the interception So now you can close the book on John Elway. Tommy Maddox is going to come in. Look at this. Demonstrative head coach, just like Daddy Bum might do it. <laughs> Enter these numbers next to John Elway's name and then close the book for this week. More importantly, when the game was being decided in the first half, he was 14 of 19. He got 230 of those 276 yards in the first half. And now Tommy Maddox comes in. In his second year from UCLA, left college early. There's Adrian Cooper in motion. Which would have been a neat trick because he would have had to have been traded from the Steelers to the Broncos during the commercial. That was actually Cedric Tillman, number 87. <laughs> yeah. The kind of day when you want to walk across to the other side of the field when you're getting belted around like this, 37 to 6. They'd like to get over there. This is a very tough time to run. You want to run here, but it's tough to run because look, look, look where all the Steelers are. They're right up on the line of scrimmage. Three and a half minutes to play. And Reggie Rivers gets a chance to tote the ball. Keevan Henry makes the stop. Rookie from Mississippi State for the Steelers. This makes you nervous as a coach. What you're trying to do is get this game over and from Denver's standpoint and Pittsburgh's. You've only got a limited number of players, period, that can travel in the NFL, and you got some good players in there. It makes you nervous, you know, to be running plays like this, going to have heavy contact. Pittsburgh's up there going after them. And it always made me nervous as a coach to be in these situations, worried about injuries. Third and six from the 35. Let's see if they let Maddox throw it. Uh-uh. He gives it to Bernstein, who's immediately upended. Chad Brown making the stop. So three and out, and they'll punt it. Tom Zack is warming up across the way. It's one of the few times that the fans have booed today. They never like for you to run on that third down, do they? I would be calling plays and I'd say hey you always have a chance to run a draw on third down or something like that I'd have to think twice I said no because if we miss it <laughs> if it's a close game I know we're going to get booed two minute warning will stop it before the punt so we'll see Tom Zach when we come back Jeff Graham lost in thought bad thoughts they are. The score here, meanwhile, in San Diego, after four Jeff Jager field goals gave the Raiders a 12 0 lead. Humphreys hit Nate Lewis for a touchdown. Chargers are back in it. Let's go there. For those of you in Denver and Pittsburgh, we stick with this game here. Pat Bolin, the owner, joining Wade Phillips on the sideline. Neil O'Donnell leaves. 18 of 32 for nearly 200 yards, 197, one interception, no touchdowns, four sacks. If Winston does not fair catch this, I'll tell you what, I got serious questions about this, having him in there. It looked like he was going to try and run with that thing. 
I think at that point in the game, boy, the only thing you want that guy doing as valuable as he is, fair catch him. Right, get your hand up. Fair catch that thing. Don't run with it and get hurt. Things continue to go something less than well for your old club, the Redskins. Now two and eight and racked by injuries. They lost to the Rams in Anaheim, 10 to six, the final there. I think roughly about half their team is on the sidelines. I feel so bad for Richie, you know, seeing a, again get his his first year as a head coach, just like Wade is here, having a tremendous number of injuries and having to pay the price for that. Tom Zach's in. The well traveled back up. Completes his first pass. No, he doesn't. Charles Davenport had it in his arms and dropped it, although Tom Zach's throw was on the money. Now to the Hager wrinkle free cotton super play of the game. Comes in the second quarter. A 63 yard pass from Elway to Shannon Sharp, who beats Dion Figures, makes a terrific diving grab. Perry, the free safety, scoots past, doesn't realize no one had touched him. All he had to do was put a hand on a shoulder pad or something. Sharp jumps back up, straight arms Perry, gets hit from behind by DJ Johnson, knocks the ball free in the end zone, and Derek Russell recovers it for the TD. That thing had everything in it. Now here's a completion to Yancey Thigpen who's taken down by Charles Dimery after a gain of 18. Tom Zach had his longest stint in the NFL with the Bears, of course, also with the Packers and the Browns before coming to Pittsburgh to back up Neil O'Donnell. Chased out of the pocket. Completes it on the run. This time Davenport does hold on. Second year man from North Carolina State. Always like those good veteran backups at quarterback, Bob. Particularly when a team has got a chance to go to, to a Super Bowl or playoffs. It's good having a guy like this around that's played a lot, that can go in there, that can even help bring along a younger quarterback. If you're working with one, I always liked having a good veteran around just like this, whether it was Jimmy Hart, Doug Williams, somebody like that that was in the background that could go in. And I think they've, I think they've made a lot of good moves here in Pittsburgh. They had a bad day today. Randy Cuthbert makes the catch. The rookie from Duke as Neil O'Donnell looks on. The previous play was a 12 yard completion to the backup tight end and special teams player Tim Jordan. They've got the ball at the 40 and we've got one more commercial. Well with six games remaining it's a dead even race in the AFC Central. Houston. And Pittsburgh each six and four and they haven't played each other yet it starts next week head to head in Houston then December 19th at Three Rivers. Thirty one seconds to play Tom Zach in there. Pumps once fires it long. And it's caught caught for the touchdown by Yancey Thigpen. That was an example of having a guy absolutely covered. As a matter of fact, in this case, the Bronco defender is actually behind the receiver when he catches the ball. He just does not locate and play the ball very well. The receivers in practice, Bob, always have so much more practice of adjusting to balls. It's a lot harder for defensive players. They're normally running backwards. They don't see as many of those, and it's tougher for them to adjust to it than a receiver. And one of the most dangerous passes in football is a high pass like that, where the receiver has a chance to react and come back to it. So a touchdown to Yancey Thigpen, the second-year man from Winston-Salem State. Well, Tom Zach. Certainly didn't hurt himself statistically. <laughs> Five of six for 81 yards on a touchdown. And they couldn't get a TD in the first 59 minutes and 38 seconds. Just two field goals. And Tom Zach gets them into the end zone in a meaningless situation where the defense obviously is giving a lot up. Although on that last play, as you said, Thigpen was well covered. It was a well-thrown ball and a good catch by Yancey. Even bother with an onside kick. Well, they try to pop one into that open area. And the Broncos are on it. That's 
Shannon Sharp in on special teams covered the ball up to complete the thought about the sibling rivalry. The Broncos played the Packers earlier this year. Green Bay won it. They had a huge lead. Elway rallied the Broncos. They came up just short. Kind of the story of Shannon Sharp's life. He had what would be a terrific game. He caught seven passes, but Sterling caught ten. <laughs> you know, he, uh, that's a pretty good day by anybody's standards, but he can't catch his brother. If there's anybody who'd like to be behind, I'm sure it's his brother. And here comes the last play of the game. Denver had 365 yards in total offense. Elway was 18 of 25 with a touchdown. He now has 18 TD passes and only six interceptions this year. Tom Zach congratulating him. Joe, it was a pleasure. It was great, Bob. I think this is a game of emotion, and Denver just had more of it. I think Pittsburgh used a lot of theirs up on Monday night. Both these teams are six and four now. 